remote work individuals love to talk about tools. What, what are you using for X? What are you using for Y? And I hate that question because I think it's, it's looking at the problem, the symptom, or actually the, the objective in the wrong way. Because you know, there's an old saying, a, a fool with a, a tool is still a fool, right? If you start with thinking about what is it that I need to solve a problem and you go straight to a tool, you're going to miss the key requirements for actually ensuring it's fixed. If, if a drunk driver gets arrested and, and you ask what kind of car they were driving, that's completely irrelevant. It's that the bonehead had too much to drink and decided to get in the car. It's what he did or he or she did that uh, was actually the mistake. Hey, and welcome to another episode of Outside the Valley, a podcast by ARC, the remote hiring platform that helps you hire remote software engineers and teams easily. In this podcast, we interview remote startup leaders, remote work advocates, and workers of distributed teams who thrive outside of Silicon Valley. I'm your host, Jovian Gautama. And as you have noticed, we're trying out this new intro format so we can directly get to the conversation. And today we are joined by someone from a company I really love. We are also a customer, actually, which is Hotjar, a powerful analytics tool that reveals the online behavior and voice of your users. The Hotjar team is 100% distributed. And other than having a great product, it's also one of the companies I really admire when it comes to transparency, team management, and, of course, company culture. You can see it reflected on their brand and how they are customer-obsessed. And here with us today is none other than Hotjar's VP of Operation, Ken Wary. Ken, welcome to the show. Awesome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, as I've mentioned to you before, we've met briefly. So I listened to your talk yeah. and the running remote conference. And I was super fascinated by, you know, how you explain the process, the internal process in Hotjar and the, the philosophy behind it. So I'd love to dive into that a bit more in this chat. First of all, can you share a bit more about yourself and actually how did you get to join Hotjar? Awesome. Yeah, happy to. So I joined Hotjar about three and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. I was at the time living in Mexico, vacationing in Belize. So the I am a digital nomad myself for mm -hmm. the past five and a half years. I've been on the road. And what makes me a little bit uh, more unique uh, than others is that I also uh, travel with my family. I travel with my wife and two kids. I have a 14-year-old daughter and a 10-year-old son. And together, we've been traveling for more than half of my son's life. And uh, so I was... I've been working as an independent contractor for, for more than two years and had seen a, an advertisement uh, for Hotjar on We Work Remotely when they were seeking a VP of operations. And it was a good match with my skill set and experience based on prior gigs that weren't remote. And I applied for it, got to know the founding team, and the rest became history. Yeah. And you mentioned about how you are slightly different because you travel with your family. And this is one of the things that we actually never really talk about in this podcast, but I'm super curious about that. I think like, let's just start with this first. So in your talk, you mentioned that you are traveling with uh, your, your, your child, right? And I think I've heard from a lot of people that one of the challenges when you are if a digital nomad lifestyle is when you have a family, what about their education and whatnot? So I'd love to understand more about this. So now you're traveling with your child. Can you share a bit more like how do you guys manage when it comes to their education and, and their lifestyle? I wonder how you, you and your family deal with that. Yeah, absolutely. The, so I'm very fortunate uh, because my partner, my wife is a educator. So she's extremely comfortable with, with, being, being their school, their principal, their teacher. And so she's been wow. uh, leading their, their education as a homeschool uh, parent. And that's, that's my full-time job is Hotjar. Her full-time job is, uh, is teaching. And so that said, we, we approach teaching from the, the aspect of my wife does direct instruction, of course, for course subjects of math and reading, writing history, so forth. But the we use the uh, two other resources to supplement that the first of which is our travels so when mm -hmm. we're traveling to a new area there's no better way to really understand the history and the culture and wow. uh, different aspects than to expose them to that locally 
Right. And so because of that, and whether that's visiting museums or battlegrounds or art galleries, they've seen some amazing things. You know, the the Parthenon and Acropolis and, and Athens or the pyramids in, in Giza. And there's a lot more that they can experience from an education perspective from actually, you know, crawling inside the Great yes. Pyramid of Giza than just reading about it in a book. And so we supplement education with the real world experiences that they have. And additionally, another uh, huge resource that we use is the internet, of course. Yep. There's, my daughter is getting into subjects now that my wife is not, um, <laughs> not an expert on. So whether that's my daughter's interested in genetics and chemistry. Wow. And uh, so there are phenomenal courses online for whatever the interest of the child is or whatever the interest of the teacher needing to supplement is. So that's, that's very much how we manage. So. Yeah, I, that is that is amazing. Actually, this in podcast interview is just like a scheme for me so you can adopt me as your child. <laughs> nah, <laughs> nah, I'm just kidding. But yeah, and I think this is something that interesting that I feel like still rarely talked about, you know, the when it comes to the lifestyle of digital nomad or even remote workers, like the child education, like there's so much there to explore, especially when the age of internet, right? You don't really need to be binded by the traditional curriculum and a sense. Oh, no, not, yeah. not at all. I mean, and, and the, the resources available online, I would make the case are, in, in a lot of cases, can be much more customized and personalized to, to the, right. the learner. For instance, my daughter loves Harry Potter, and she was interested in genetics. And online is a highly rated Harry Potter for genetics wow. uh, a, a course where they actually look at uh, genetics traits amongst different Harry Potter characters based on JK Rowling's books. I mean, right down the alley of my daughter who's salivating for this course, wow. and took it, loved it. Um, and they, there's just different unique ways of teaching that I, I was not, I didn't have available to me when I was in traditional schools right. and, and my wife wouldn't uh, have the creative juices to be able to deliver that, but somebody else does. And we can tap into that for a reasonable fee. So. Wow. Harry Potter and genetics, you cannot be any more niche than that, I think. <laughs> <laughs> right. So yeah, now I want to talk a bit more about when, what, what comes a lot in this podcast about communication and there's also something a big theme of in hot jar, right? You know, and not only hot jars in remote work in general, you know, meeting culture, team culture, asking communication and so on. So I want to talk about communication first. As we kind of know, there are two thoughts when it comes to communication in remote teams. They're like async and synchronous, right? And some people swear by async and other people that not async don't work. We need like FaceTime, like routinely. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like Hotjar's uh, communication mode is leaning toward the async where uh, you can give each other slack. And, and I realized that, of course, there's no right or wrong. It all depends on the setup of the company. But I wonder in Hotjar itself, what, what was it like that made you guys realize that, hey, async is like the best for us? Yeah. So I, I think you're absolutely right. We do lean async. We don't have a hard and fast, you know, thou shall not jump on a call kind of rule, but they, you know, sometimes they're, they're needed, but we want to always try to default to async because if you, what, what led us down this path is about a year ago, we're like, oh, wow, everybody is so busy. We're, we're, we're our productivity was, was starting to drag. And we, we knew we had a great team. We knew we had a lot of talent, but we weren't, we weren't moving as fast as we had previously. And so one of the really big keys to understanding that was we started pulling up people's calendars, right? We have open calendars and, and hot jars, you mentioned, were extremely transparent. And as you start looking at calendars, you just see these, these either blocks of time of, you know, 60, 90 minutes long or a litany of, you know, 15 uh, minute, 20 minute meetings all scattered throughout somebody's calendar. And it became very clear of, wow, that this person has no ability to flow in their day. They, they're not able to really sync with uh, the stuff that's uh, hot and heavy uh, on their plate. And so led us to um, examine that a bit more, find out what was driving some of the, all, all of these micro meetings. And it was clear that what was doing it was we'd started to default to the aspect of, oh, I have a question, let's jump on a call, as opposed to have a question, let me throw it in a, an email or a Slack message that can be responded at whenever the person is truly available to, to, to tackle it. 
Yeah, you mentioned that you like the team realized that it started to drag down productivity like a year ago, right? How, how did you discover that? How did you realize that? Okay, productivity is going down. What were the symptoms or signs? Because I feel like in a lot of companies, like people feel like they're slightly unproductive, but they don't know like if it's they don't know how to tell it to people. Like I wonder what you, what you guys do to detect those kind of things. Yeah, the the biggest thing was we'd started to miss a, a lot of our internal forecasts for right. for projects being done. So we're not hardcore on this is going to be shipped and done by this date and and launched because things always get more complex or you might yeah. have an emergency for customers and things get derailed. But we do put target dates on things or target you know by the end of this quarter we will have done this, and we when. Uh, one of the things that's extremely important to us is we work in an agile environment. And so we're constantly doing retros uh, to take a yeah. look at, Hey, how did we do last quarter? And so as we did a quarterly retro, it became clear of, wow, we thought we would have been much further along on our roadmap by now than, than we are. Why is that? And then it began to go into a root cause uh, analysis to say, what's going on here. And the calendar was really kind of the glaring thing that, that jumped out at us to say, wow, here's a really good example as to why some of our really key resources were getting bogged down. Got it. Got it. So after you discovered the main issue of the, of the, the whole thing, right? Uh, what were the next steps that you guys did to mitigate all of this, which I, I, I think like started the, the movement to be more async. Yeah, it, it would, and, and to be, and to be fair, it was much more of a uh, reminder to, to, to go async. We've always tried to, to be an async aspect, but over time you, you lose focus on that or, or yeah. maybe you realize you need more focus on it. And so really kind of the, the next thing that, that came about were twofold. Number one, we, we updated what we call our weekly schedule. So across Hotjar, even though we are, we're agile, we do, we do propose a lot of things to the team of, hey, consider working in this manner. So we have a, we, our CEO created a, a, a really nice post that we put out to all team members that said, hey, here, think about organizing your week this way. And so let's front load meetings on, on, on Monday so we can kick things off and with planning and one-on-ones where needed. So you get that running and the team can, has a really good cadence throughout the week. And mm -hmm. let's also make sure that we don't overburden ourselves with meetings beyond that. So let's keep, let's think, you know, scrum based, you know, time boxed and efficient, you know, daily check-ins from, from teams. But let's also look to make sure that we, we protect the aspects of, really deep work. And so proposing different chunks for that, one of the things that, that we recommend to the team is consider a Wednesday meeting free. Meeting free mm. Wednesday, let's not get together and have meetings unless of course you really absolutely need to. And so I'll probably on any given Wednesday only have one meeting and the rest is for my deep, deep work. And, and so we, we publish this we talk about it to the team in both synchronous and asynchronous aspects to make sure that it, it begins to be much more part of our DNA and reminding. And then we also incorporated that back into our onboarding as well. So when new team mm -hmm. members join, this is another thing that we noticed because we've had a lot of really good growth in size of our team. Yeah. Uh, one new team member joining who's continuously pinging people on Slack looking for real-time answers when the that begins to be very disruptive and that could be a little bit contagious, right? Yeah. And so one of the things we did, we did is let's make sure during onboarding, we reinforce this to people, make sure they know that, Hey, you're new. You may forget this. It's all right, but always default back to this type of uh, thinking. Yeah. There's a lot of there that I want to unpack slowly because it's related to, you know, uh, hiring, onboarding, documentation, and sure. just like company culture in, in general. So I think I remember you shared this uh, last year because in Hotjar, like you mentioned, there's this kind of like, so I relate to the post that you mentioned. So Monday is uh, meetings day and Wednesday is like no meeting day. So is it like, is, is, so it's more like a general guideline. I'm, am am I right. correct? That's okay. right. Uh, yeah, that, that, that is a fantastic. Well, one of the things I just remembered, one of the things that I found interesting because people, some people thought the when it comes to async versus sync is the tools that you use but 
it's not. It's really just because the process. There's this analogy that I, that I always remember. Can you share that? The drunk driving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of people love to talk about tools and especially yeah. y- y- remote work individuals love to talk about tools. What, what are you using for X? What are you using for Y? And I hate that question because I think it's, it's looking at the, 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 the problem, the symptom, or actually the, the, the objective in the wrong way, because you know, there's an old saying, a, a fool with a, a tool is still a fool, right? If you start with something that, if you start with thinking about what is it that I need to solve a problem and you go straight to a tool, you're going to miss the key requirements for actually ensuring it's fixed. And I think the analogy I shared at Running Remote was if, if a drunk driver gets arrested and, and you ask what kind of car they were driving, that's completely irrelevant. It's that the bonehead had too much to drink and decided to get in the car. It's what he did or he or she did that uh, was actually the mistake. And so it's important that you look at things from a process perspective of how are you going to use a tool? So you can use Slack asynchronously yep. and use it to save threads and to look at follow-ups from that perspective. Or you can look at it as a real-time synchronous tool that is highly, highly effective or disruptive. It really depends upon your process and how you encourage people to use it. Yeah, I gotta confess, even us, like we fell into that trap a couple of times. Basically, the shiny new uh, object syndrome. Hey, this is cool. Should we try using this? And then we even subscribe to it for a couple of months, and then up, oh, nobody using it. And then just that's a couple dollars, a couple hundred dollars down the drain. It happens. Yeah. So I also want to talk about we've talked about meetings. Now I want to talk about the meeting culture itself in Hotjar. I think there's a lot of people, companies that still struggle to have effective meeting. So what is the meeting culture like in Hot Is it some kind of certain guideline on how you should do meetings to save time and then to be make it more effective? Yeah. So, so much like we talked about before of we believe in guidelines, right? So mm-hmm. every team, every function, every, every meeting may have a different objective or different personality and how it's run. You know, the, there are some 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 teams that will utilize uh, Trello during a meeting or other teams that will utilize Asana during a meeting. But so what we've said is, let's, let's go back to what are the core requirements of a meeting? Number one, it's got to uh, have a true purpose and agenda. So if you don't have a true purpose and agenda, you shouldn't schedule a meeting or and more, more even more so you should never accept the invite for that meeting. So it needs to have a clear uh, objective. And I, I decline meetings on occasion because uh, a team member doesn't put in there what it is that the agenda is about. What are yeah. we trying to cover? I'm not talking about like, Hey, for 10 minutes, we're going to cover this and then five minutes, this, and we're not talking about uh, Uber detail, but what are the objectives of the meeting? We're going to talk about these three things and we're going to come with an, a, a decision on them. Okay. That's an agenda. The, but so that that's number one. And then number two, it's, it should only have the minimum uh, number of participants that are required. So Mm -hmm. don't invite the whole team just because they might be interested. Oftentimes that there's uh, that creates the aspect of what uh, what's characterized as uh, FOMO, right? I've been invited to this meeting. I got a a fear of missing out. I'm going to make sure that I attend it. So you only invite those that are truly required. If you think it's good for other informational purposes, record it, record it on Zoom and share out, share it out to other people. Therefore, if they are really concerned about it uh, or really super interested, they can get caught up on it. The, so those are kind of the, the two parameters that we have as core requirements for any meeting at Hotjar. Beyond that, again, we, we leave it really up to the people as to, to the, and to the topic as to what's required or what's the best way to, to run that meeting. Does Hotjar do like all all hands meeting company all hands meeting yeah so we each week we actually do one I we see. call it our weekly release meeting so what what the the purpose of this meeting is it's an hour every friday and it's it is recorded for those that have a conflict or perhaps out of the office and the purpose of it is to to keep the entire team abreast of the changes that are occurring within our environment and we've talked about moving this async but we're not quite ready to do it yet it's actually part of our culture part of our cadence that we have as a company every friday since we work in an agile environment we 
each team, whether you're an engineering team involved in front end, back end, or you're in our marketing team, you have shipped something for the week. Yeah. Um, and it's the ability for you to highlight what is shipped if it is notable. It's not required that every team present because perhaps it's you're working on a, a multi-sprint release. That's, that's fine, but you'll probably present the next week or the week after because your work will, will build. And so we want to make sure that we're really ingrained in the aspect of always be shipping, always be improving. And so it's the ability for each team to, to share that. So we do that each week. And then once a month, we have an all hands meeting that involves looking at in a very transparent way, how did the company perform last month? Let's look at our KPIs and key metrics, share that with every team member, <clears throat> and then give them the ability to, in an AMA format, ask questions to executives about our performance and why something was unexpectedly good or why something didn't happen according to our forecast. So. Got it. Is the AMA like anonymous or it's just like everyone on Zoom can just raise their hand and ask questions? Yeah. What we found is now that the company, uh, Hotjar now has more than a hundred team members. If we leave, leave, leave it for open mics and talking and, and raising hands, we're probably going to miss somebody. And, and, especially if people have uh, common questions. So we use the, the tool Slido uh, yeah. to be able to do, so people can submit questions either named or anonymous. We encourage that, uh, we encourage that the named perspective as part of our transparent culture to do that. But mm -hmm. notice, notice what the way I described it too, right? Slido is what we use, but first thing I did is describe why we have, why we can't use Zoom and raising hands and open mics talking. So it's really important to always look at you know, break down what the problem is, then come up with a solution. So, Great. Yeah, uh, that's fantastic. So related to the, the weekly sprint and the agile culture that Hotjar adopts, it's, uh, as far as I know, Hotjar utilized the Tripe system when it comes to, you know, product development and probably some marketing. As far as I know, uh, people call it different names, Tripes, Squads. And can you elaborate a bit more on how does Hotjar use Tripes and utilize it? And how does it work? Cool. So the what I'll describe is is what's in place now, and what I described at running remote was an earlier iteration. So we're always evolving oh, okay. and changing yeah. as we as we look at this. So, but the purpose is still the same, which is if it, it, this this kind of came about uh, more than a year ago at, at Hotjar, where we were looking at, hey, what are the things we want to address at Hotjar? We want to address onboarding. We want customers to be onboarded in the best possible way as they first join Hotjar. And, or wow, we want people to regularly utilize our service and get more value. Okay, well, who owns that? And um, who owns onboarding at Hotjar? And is that marketing because they helped acquire the customer? Is it is it engineering because they're building the product or is it customer success because they want our customers to utilize it more? And we had an ownership problem. And mm -hmm. so what we began to realize is actually, yes, all of them own onboarding, <laughs> but the, how do you address that so that you're making the most direct benefit to the, to our customers at the same time. And so what we did is began to align people in what we've called tribes. And now we have two tribes and, the, the tribes are focused on the user journey, the front end journey, and then the mm -hmm. consistent nurturing of the customers to stay with us. Beneath those tribes is a, is a second structure called squads. And so within the squads oh. are even more discrete areas of ownership. I and see. Uh, across these tribes, they're multi, multidisciplinary. They involve our engineering team, our product managers, our, our marketing and customer support as well, so that we have direct line of sight as to who is engaged as a micro team, a squad or, mm -hmm. uh, or a tribe, you know, what areas of our customer journey. And we found it to be a lot, a lot more direct and clear as to ownership and areas of improvement. That's definitely still a work in progress as we continue to evolve and tweak that, but it's, it's getting much better. Yeah. I'm just curious. So on the tribes itself, so like you mentioned, there are probably a couple of different people from different teams that is responsible for the onboarding in on a certain way, right? You know, engineers, design and marketing. So mm -hmm. in that tribe itself, who who is this decision maker usually? What who has the last word, so to speak? <laughs> Depends on the, the size of the issue. I see. The we we do we do look for our product managers to play a an extremely strong role in the leadership of this. And so 
more so than anyone, they tend to, they, they make the majority of the decisions, not, not obviously in isolation, they work with the team in doing so, but when it comes to, all right, we, you know, what's going to get the, you know, the most attention from our users and provide them the most benefit, are we going to do A or B? They're responsible for making sure that the decision is made in the most successful driven data per, data driven perspective possible. And so they tend to make most of the decisions. Obviously, if it's a longer term strategic decision and that that then moves up the chain to more of an executive decision. But as far as the regular improvements along the roadmap that's planned, it tends to be our product managers. Got it. Yeah, uh, that totally makes sense. So I want to move on a bit into the hot jars hiring and onboarding process. So this is one of the my, my most favorite topic because it's really hard. <laughs> <laughs> and people have different like ideas on how to approach. So I'm just curious, like, okay, for hot jar itself, as far as I know, especially when it comes to remote team, you have to be good at hiring because if you if it's if it's a bus, it's really sometimes takes longer to find out because you're not in the same place. So I wonder in, in terms of, let's start from hiring. Do you think there's anything on the hiring phase that makes Hotjar just a bit special or, or different compared to other remote companies? I, I would say if I could recharacterize the question a little bit, mm -hmm. I, I don't believe that, that there is a fundamental uh, difference in how remote companies should operate and how mm, a physical company should operate. Mm -hmm. I believe that the same symptoms of failure exist in both. The beauty of remote is you can fail faster, which I view as a gift because you have the ability, if you structure it right, to, to actually further things in a much quicker uh, quicker way but i think that the the benefits and drawbacks of from a hiring perspective are very much the same and and so at hotjar the way we uh, do recruitment is the same way that if i were to work in a brick and mortar business tomorrow i would encourage mm -hmm. that we we look at it the exact same way because you you get to more of the the true working dynamics and company culture match quicker in my opinion so does that make sense? And I can dive into how we yes. do it. Yes, I think I, th I think that kind of makes sense, especially in the remote company. Now that I think about it, I think I think in my opinion, like in the remote companies, I think there's more emphasis on not your resume, but it's more like, are you a self starter? I feel like this like the, the theme that you have because resume sometimes it's it's hard to identify this good fit or not. But if you're a self starter, uh, as in like. Yeah. Oh, I've created a podcast on a side project. I do meetups and that is a, a big sign. I think, okay, how about, let's say, what are the biggest characteristics when it comes to culture fit when you're looking for people uh, in Hotjar? Yeah, so the uh, uh, Hotjar has five core values. And mm -hmm. what we try to do with that as part of our interview process is making sure that there is mapping to the core values. To your point, right. I fully, fully agree with you that there is one of the, one of our, well, two of, two of our core, core values relate to what you said of, you know, Hey, or do they have something going on on the side? Or are they doing things? Which is um, number one, uh, one of our core values is always be learning. So are they doing something to further themselves, whether that's, completely unrelated to the job. That's totally cool, right? What are they doing to show that they're contributing to their own learnings? Are they a lifelong learner, right? Are they learning something outside of their core skill set and domain? Because that tells you that they're obviously the type of people who are passionate about getting better about something, even yep. if it doesn't relate to their, to their job. That's fine. It, it, trust me, it bleeds over. The, and, and then the other one, another core value that, that in generally is embedded within that is we have a core value of be bold and move fast. So are you showing in incremental improvements in doing so? Or is it, no, I'm working on this uber long doctorate that you know is going to take you know, forever. Granted, that is showing a lifelong learner, but how are you approaching that uber long doctorate? What is your path mm. for uh, incremental improvements across the board to get that done? And so diving into that, whether that's you know, a doctorate or whether that is focused on much like you said of like, Hey, I'm going to these conferences, doing these meetups and you know, where you see all these incremental aspects of growth as well. So looking at them together is really important for us. And so you begin to see that, you know, there, there is a culture match from that perspective of if it is looking at things at a very large perspective, it probably means uh, that 
they might, an individual might not move as quickly and as fast as we like to move. We're, we're very high, high paced in that environment. Yeah. Yeah. So like, I, I think you frame it really well. Like, is there like an incremental steps of these stuff? Like if there's a big project, like, are they able to kind of like, okay, this is step one, the, the next step that I can do in the next five minutes, for example, and you want to see that kind of uh, clarity because getting back to the, the theme of remote work is that sometimes not everyone can help you and guide you to what to do next. Sometimes you have to be able to find it out for you, yourself and then try to break down the, the big picture to uh, more smaller slices. And it doesn't mean that this is not important for non-remote companies, but it's just that it's even much more important. I, I, at least in my opinion, it's even much more important and when you're working remotely, especially when you're looking for remote jobs, because yeah, yeah nobody can control you <laughs> in a way. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's funny that you say that. So when I was looking for, when I was going through the interview process with Hotjar three and a half years ago, our CEO and founder, David, even told me that one of the things that attracted him to me was the aspect of that I was a traveler and that I was constantly traveling and having to figure out how to constantly move throughout the, the world, not just with myself, but with my family and figuring out whether that's immigration or travel or language or culture was, was and still is part of how I am a lifelong learn, learner, mm -hmm. shows an adaptiveness to change, the ability to be flexible. And so from these perspectives, these are characteristics that mapped for him, mapped me to the culture. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's, you can do it in a bazillion different ways, right? It's what, right. what is it you're into and how does and, and how does that display right yeah yeah definitely definitely so i want to move on a bit the next phase after hiring of course you after you find the right person you onboard them so this is a big issue even in co-located companies sometimes yeah. even us so that we still have that issue for example where do i find this document that's this onboarding we're getting better at that but there's some small uh tweak that we still have to make so can you share a bit so when someone just joined Hotjar, this is their first day, what was the onboarding process like? Yeah, so we start our onboarding from the day somebody signs a contract with us. So if you sign a contract with us and you're going to join in two months because you have to, you know, you're leaving another job or taking a break in between, hmm. really from, from our internal perspective, onboarding has started, which means that A, we need to get you information about you know, whether that's for, if you're going to become an employee of Hotjar I mean, we employ in three different countries, what are the benefits and perks that they need to get signed up for, for payroll? Getting that set up up front is extremely helpful, but also it means that we want you, because when day one starts, we want your account set up. We want uh, you to start hit the ground running with a computer at home and, and that it's secure, meets our security requirements. So we need to get a computer order for you as soon as possible. And so one of the things that we do is uh, we provide at Hotjar a 5,000 euro home office budget. And so from that perspective, it gives the ability to order the computer that, I'm sorry, 3,000. Um, we, um, <laughs> five, three. Um, yeah, so we, 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 you need to order the laptop that you want. We give the ability and freedom to the team members to order a laptop that works for them, you know, whether, whether that's a Mac or a Windows device, whether that's pick your brand. We have some security requirements that we have for all devices and some minimum specs. But for the most part, if you're a Windows gal or a Mac guy, it doesn't matter. Order what sees fit. Because we hire in so many different countries, it means that it also may take a while for it to ship to you. You may, yep. may have to get caught up in taxation or, or anything like that. So uh, it's important that we start our onboarding at that time because on day one, we want you to start with your computer, open it up, and then that's when the onboarding truly takes place from, uh, from a more visible perspective. But it's important that behind the scenes, a lot of stuff start before. So day one involves really setting up a litany of accounts. So we, we, we use more than 100 different SaaS-based tools. And in order to have access to all of the important process documentation or the collaboration or anything like that, you need to have access to the tools. And so a new team member will have quite a bit of setup to do from that perspective. Our expectation is for their first week that they're not doing their job. 
Hmm. Their, their job is to actually learn about our environment. And so we have an onboarding uh, Trello board that every team member is assigned and they go through it step by step to learn about the company, to get introductions to different team members, to review our processes, to set up different accounts. And there's a lot to learn, right? To learn about our tech stack, to learn about you know, how our devs work, to learn about you know, active backlogs and where they exist and how to get access to them. And so there's a huge exposure to that. And that's, that's week one. Week two is really, <clears throat> once you're over some of the standard operational things, then it gets into much more of a department onboarding. And so the, the engineers have a particular uh, onboarding beyond the company onboarding. So week one is more company onboarding. Week two is more departmental onboarding. And so there's a process that we have across every department. Some departments have the, their onboarding may last several weeks. So we'll pair our engineers together. There will be shadowing. Same thing on customer support. Let's shadow the new team members. Let's teach them our ethos and our, our tone of voice with customers. So we have consistency and regularity, but also the ability for them to add their own personality. And so we do that across the board. Wow. Yeah, I am to amazed by like what you say like onboarding stays from the onboarding starts from day one even though they have like two months gap between when they sign the contract and then uh, they start the job i never heard of anything like this actually and yeah i mean this is just sometimes this logistic thing that unsexy in a way but yeah yeah I, <laughs> yeah and and this is like the operations thing so people like you are the one that makes this happen which is leads me to our next question more like the topic that i want to talk about is documentation cool. especially the the hot jars team manual i actually found this by accident even before i reach out to you uh, i totally forgot but i'm just surprised that okay these uh, these are the uh, team manual and i think you guys use confluence for that yeah. by the way for listeners you can find it in the show notes and you can like it's very thorough and there are things that I didn't even realize that, yeah, you should write this down. The one that, I, that stand out is like how you should use the company's laptop, right? I use my company laptop, but there's no such thing as the, the through, okay, what you can do and what you cannot do. So I want to talk a bit, a bit about how did you go about approaching this whole gigantic thing about documentation? Because a lot of, I think a lot of remote companies are not, are not good at it. Because either they're too lazy or they don't know how to document a certain stuff. And I'm just curious, like, what are the, the basic principles that you guys have when it comes to documentation across teams? Yeah. So, like you said, we use uh, Confluence. Um, mm -hmm. And Confluence is a knowledge-based tool. Which So, what we look at that is to say... If there is a process, if there is a procedure, if there is something that needs to be a decision that is has has permanence as permanent as anything is and, and right. I say it because nothing's fully permanent the it should be documented and it should be searchable for the team and so what what what's the link that's included in the show notes is probably 10% of what we have documented in Confluence. We have a lot of internal process procedures and the, whether that's operational related or, or development related within Confluence. And so as a new team member, it is your encyclopedia for how we get things done at, at Hotjar. And it's super important that this be documented and, and people oftentimes I think uh, say, well, it's because you're remote and you need to have that. And it's like, no, you're crazy if you don't think, you know, co-located or brick and mortar place should have stuff like this documented. Yeah. It takes away, A, it infuses back with our, with our core values of being transparent. So we document how we do performance reviews yeah. and, and, and how they're there. And that's all available for somebody to see. And everybody should see how they're going to be evaluated and what the, the criteria are. And when that changes, be able to uh, both be alerted to that. And so those are the kind of things that we put on Confluence. Um, it really gets circles right back to our core values of transparency within operations. But within uh, engineering, it's really core to how do you, you know, how do you make sure that everybody is uh, following the same procedures when it comes to code reviews or, you know, when they're doing integrations or anything like that, that these, mm -hmm. these aspects are really important to have documented and searchable. 
Right. Um, just curious. So let's say um, in the engineering team, like you mentioned, right, when it comes to like code quality or certain guidelines, who are responsible to maintain the documentation for the uh, team, if that makes sense? Is it like some kind of engineering lead? Yeah, it depends on the, 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 the type of documentation, right? So mm-hmm. if the, so first off, anybody at Hotjar can edit almost any page on Confluence. I see. So in a, in, in, in a broad sense, it's everybody's job um, mm. to update. So if you see, if there's something that's out of date and stuff gets out of date, everything needs constant maintenance, then do it. And so if obviously if it's, uh, hey, all engineers are going to start doing X, then that's probably something an engineering lead or I see. engineering director should be updating. But if it's like, you know, oh, this, this is not where we store this anymore, or this is mm-hmm. not, you know, how we do builds, those types of things are tweaked all the time by the entire team. Right. So it's kind of like, let's say when it comes to, again, as an example, like engineering, the lead will be somewhat be like own the documentation process. And when it comes to like the whole company-wide operations, it's you at the VP operations and with people up, so I assume? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very much right. so. Right. That makes sense. So yeah, I think in this podcast, I think you are the very first, uh, I hope I'm not wrong, but I think you are the very first like ops person which is really familiar with the, like really get down and dirty when it comes to logistics and documentation and whatnot. And of course, day-to-day operations. I'm just curious, since you've been in Hotjar for a while now, is there any mistakes that you've made and learned from as the VP of operations of a remote company or probably not, or maybe just as a company in general? Yeah, absolutely. So hate to say it, but I'll circle back to our core values of learn by mm-hmm. doing. You know, yeah. part of part of what we have within that uh, core value is the fact that we're going to make mistakes, and that's okay. The important part is, did you learn from them? Did you make improvements upon that? So yeah, mm-hmm. you know, hell yeah, we've we've made a lot of mistakes. Uh, I've made a lot of mistakes. Mm-hmm. The the biggest mistake I would say overall, I was recently doing a personal retrospective myself for 2019, and the I think it's the biggest mistake I've made in, in certain aspects is not not hiring fast enough mm-hmm. from the aspect of as we grow, as we mature, as we continue to introduce, you know, greater accountability for our team, as well as for our business and for our customers, it's keeping up with the hiring that's necessary for that and, and looking beyond where we are today instead to where we're going tomorrow and, and beyond and building that strategy out. So I would say that's you know, my own personal most recent learning, but we have done uh, a, a number of different you know mistakes from not being as clear about what what is a hardcore process, you know, where thou shalt not uh, do right. something versus, hey, you know, this is our recommendation, but ro- feel free to roll your own and, and have some flexibility with this guideline. And so I think it, it's really important that we've evolved to the aspect of making sure that that's very, very clear as to what is a, you know, a hardcore process we must follow versus a, a guideline that is flexible. Yeah, that is really hard, isn't it? Because now that you say it, it's, it's, it's sometimes hard because there are things that is kind of like in the middle, like it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be like a strict process because it will feel bad. But in a way, if it's too loose, then it's also bad for the company. Right. So I think I talked to uh, Laura Roder from Meet Edgar a while ago. So mm-hmm. her approach is that, for example, there are things like that that are kind of like vague and there's some nuance in it. For example, if she gave me this example, if someone is going on a business trip and then the company will pay for their accommodations, if there's some kind of like this kind of like norm of the hotel rate or what is the highest can I go, right? Sometimes people are just too afraid or companies are just too afraid to be, nope, this, this is the, the ceiling or something like because they you're afraid to be seen as cheap and whatnot. But yes, those kind of things that nuance, it's, it's really hard. You know, yeah, to decide. Yeah, it is because you you also you don't you you need to balance the this is the way we do it and and we're flexible with the actually we can't be flexible on this. You also there's also the aspect of like you said earlier, do we really need to document this? If you 
if you're asking yourself that question, the answer is probably yes. But because you think, well, this is common sense. We wouldn't expect this. Uh, but at some point, the situation arises where you, you probably should document that question. Right. And it goes back to kind of like the theme that we have with transparency. Even the goal to be more transparent, it's like incremental, right? Sometimes it's not easy to be just, mm-hmm. boom, you're transparent. But the things like you have to decide, should we be transparent on this? Or, or not. And it goes back to the company vision, uh, core value, and so on. So that's why having an ops person is really important. <laughs> <laughs> it's an unsexy job, but it's very underrated, especially when it comes to remote companies. It is that important. Yeah, yeah. And it's important to, 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 to have getting back to that accountability. So across operations at Hotjar, everybody defines operations differently, but operations at mm. Hotjar encompasses people ops, it encompasses finance, and it encompasses compliance. And so the within each of those areas, we have a lead who's responsible for that. And that the, that lead is responsible for making sure our finance documentation is up to date. How do we do expense reports? When do we do monthly reporting? And where is that available? You know, compliance, you know, what about GDPR? How are we, you know, what are the controls that we need to update and inform people about and across the board? Yeah. So it's really important that you have discrete ownership, right? Uh, but yet the aspect of who's responsible for making sure we meet GDPR compliance, or really the entire company is, Yeah. who's accountable is that lead. And so it is making sure that everybody has the flexibility to be responsible, uh, but ultimately accountable. Yeah, I am tempted to go through that rabbit hole of just talk about the finance, <laughs> compliance, but they'll probably need like a second part of this podcast and we have like six minutes left. Yeah. Okay, Ken, thank you so much for your time today. I really learned a lot. And how can um, people find you or learn more about Hotjar Online? Yeah, awesome. So first off, we are hiring. We're always hiring. So if you go to hotjar.com, there's a career section and you can find out all about the perks that we offer, the way we work, information associated to our hiring process in a transparent way. And I encourage you, if you're interested in looking uh, for engineering, uh, de- design, development, marketing, operations, uh, customer service, check us out, please. Uh, yeah. For me in particular, you can find out more information about me on LinkedIn as well as also email. So the email is ken at hotjar.com. So. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ken. Awesome. I enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. Great questions. And that's it for another episode of Outside the Valley brought to you by ARC. We created this podcast with the hope that in each episode, you can learn something new from other remote startup people. So if you have any feedback or suggestions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me at jovian at arc.dev. It's J-O-V-I-A-N at A-R-C dot D-E-V. Or you can find us on Twitter at arc.dev. See you next week with another episode of Outside the Valley and ciao.